Hello everyone and thank you for joining us on Onko coming up on today's show. What might happen if America were to turn its most devastating policies and deadly weapons upon itself? That's the question posed by Egyptian-born Canadian journalist and author Omar al in his post-apocalyptic debut, American War. Set on the cusp of the 21st and 22nd century, the futuristic novel imagines the U.S. in the throes of a second civil war, split between the North and the South and its catastrophic aftermath. Omar al thank you very much for joining us on Encore. Now, this isn't a story about war. It's about ruin. Those are your words. How do you distinguish between the two? I mean, I, I never set out to write a story about a particular war. In fact, I never really set out to write a story about America. Um, what I wanted to get at was, was a story about the universal nature of revenge, um, the idea that all those people very far away, be they in, in Afghanistan or in Iraq, um, if you're living in the United States, there's a kind of, or if you're living in the Western world, there's a sense of privilege where you get to assume that they have very exotic motivations or they have very exotic reactions to being on the losing end of a war. Um, but what I wanted to talk about was the idea that, that all of us respond to injustice and all of us respond to being on the losing end of a war the same way. So what I did was take all of the aspects of these wars that have defined the world in my lifetime and recast them as elements of something very close to home, uh, in this case, a uh, second civil war. So that's, that's sort of how I got to it. Now, on the topic of the losing aspects of the war, drone killings, suicide bombings and refugee camps have turned the American dream into a living nightmare in American war. It's a bold and confronting vision and also a very personal one penned by a resident of the United States. You live in Portland, Oregon. What feelings are you trying to evoke in the reader and uh, what questions are you trying to resolve for yourself? I think fundamentally the feeling I'm trying to evoke is empathy. Um, and I make the distinction between empathy and sympathy. Um, the, the, the central character in this book, Surat Chestnut, um, is not someone that by the end of the story I want you to sympathize with or like or apologize for. I only want you to understand how she gets to the place where she ends up. And so fundamentally I was going for the idea that it's possible to understand why somebody does something without taking their side, which when you live in the United States, especially in the last 16 years, uh, that gray space between us and them, the idea that you can understand somebody, has sort of been obliterated. It's been a very sort of polarized world. And so that's what I was trying to get at. That uh, question of us versus them, that's something that you've uh, investigated more, uh, gone into more detail about when you've, during your work as a journalist. You covered the Black Lives Matter movement in Ferguson, the Arab Spring in Egypt, the war in Afghanistan, military trials at Guantanamo. How uh, has your experience as a journalist shaped this narrative? I mean, in two ways. There's the superficial way. Um, a lot of what's in that book is stolen from my experiences as a journalist, just straight theft. Um, there's a scene in the book where there's a polio vaccination worker going around a refugee camp in the southern U.S. Um, that's taken from time I spent with a, with a polio vaccination team in Kandahar. Um, the layout of the refugee camp in the book is, is based on the NATO airfield in Kandahar, also the, the tent cities in Guantanamo Bay. Um, and then thematically it informs the book just in the sense of symmetry. Um, there are a lot of things that I've covered that felt the same, um, not in the sense that the details were the same. But for example, I was a journalist for 10 years. Uh, I was tear gassed twice. Uh, I was tear gassed when I was in Cairo covering the Arab Spring and when I was in Ferguson, Missouri covering the Black Lives Matter movement. And that's not to say that being in one place suddenly informs the other, only that the visual language was the same. You know, the very militarized police presence, that sort of thing. Um, and so thematically it informed the book with this sense of symmetry, that it's not very different when these things start happening. Thematically as well as uh, stylistically as well, you use uh, uh, fictional news clippings, memoirs, government documents to tell your story. Uh, now, something you touch on in the book is the notion that war is the end of innocence. What are the consequences for ordinary civilians in this book, particularly your protagonist, Sarat? Uh, losing a war is akin to moving backwards in time. You know, you can look at pictures of, of Kabul from 50 years ago and it feels like someplace that's more futuristic than the current state of Kabul. The idea of being on the losing end of a war being this kind of march backwards in time. Um, and I think that's the central effect that it has on, on ordinary civilians is that 
your future seems obliterated and so you turn around and you're always backwards facing. You're always focused on your own history, your own memory, uh, because that's something that, that can't be taken away from you. You know, you can, you go to war with somebody, you can obliterate their future, but you can't take away their past. And so that was, that's one of the things in the book. Um, the Southerners in the book who are on the losing end of the war are, are obsessed with the past. You can't take away their past, but what about their childhood? In war, there is no childhood. Those are the words of 13-year-old Miriam Rawick. She grew up in the Jabal Saideh neighborhood in Aleppo, the northern Syrian city devastated by years of fighting between President Bashar al-Assad's regime and rebels. Miriam has published a book here in France about her experiences. Le Journal de Miriam is the diary of innocence lost and life torn apart by war. The simple pleasures in life. A family stroll through the park, hearing the sound of children at play. Miriam Rawik is now far away from the war in Syria. At age 13, it's her first time out of her country and her first time in Paris. Look at them going down the slides and on the merry-go-rounds. My head's spinning just looking at them. <laughs> the smell of the trees here reminds me of the park in Aleppo. No one's been there in a long time because of the war. The war prevented us from going. Her ordeal lasted five years, and she wrote it all down in her diary. What her life used to be before the conflict, the laughs, the parties, and the smell of birthday cakes. And then the first anti-government demonstrations, the bombings, and that morning in March 2013 when Islamist rebels took over her neighborhood. After that, we left. In the street, I saw a man with a very thick beard who was dressed in black and had a weapon in his hand. He was a terrorist. He was repulsive. Memories that will never fade. In January, after the rebels retreated, she went back to her apartment. It was beyond recognition. And so was the area she grew up in. They stole my home. They stole my childhood. In war, there is no childhood. It's confiscated. The city is now almost entirely under regime control, and for Miriam, life has returned to relative normalcy. And that's worth a song. Inspiring story, generation scarred by war. Like Miriam Omar, do you feel that writing is, is a cathartic exercise? For me, the process of having written is cathartic. Once I'm on the other side of writing, um, having sort of rid myself of whatever thoughts I had and put them on the paper, that's cathartic. The actual process of, of writing is anxiety-ridden and not particularly pleasant. Well, you touch on the consequences of climate change in American war. Imagine an Earth like Venus with a temperature of 250 degrees and raining sulfuric acid. Now, that's not just the premise, perhaps, for another book, but what Stephen Hawking recently said could be the future. How do you feel about Donald Trump's denial of climate change? We have a tendency to have trouble um, foreseeing the, the problems that take longer than about 30 years, you know, the lifespan of a mortgage. Um, and so the worst impacts of climate change are going to take place on a longer time frame than that. Uh, and so it's very easy to dismiss them, particularly if you're in the political sphere where you're worried about next year's election, not getting reelected 30 years from now. Um, I think the present administration in the United States has been an absolute nightmare on a number of issues and, and chiefly ecologically. Um, and the worst part is they're not going to have to suffer the consequences. You know, that entire administration will be long gone before we start to see the worst impacts of their non-committal. Did you take a turn from fact to fiction, we could say, to give yourself more freedom as a storyteller? Uh, fiction for me is the world in which I get to explore questions. Um, and that's why I started, I started writing, because I have no answers to any of these questions, but it's, it's things I wanted to explore. And so that's, that was the, the beginning of American War. That's how it came about. The beginning of the American War and the beginning of your uh, path as, as a fiction writer, perhaps. Any uh, more books coming up? 
I hope so. I mean, this is this is the fourth novel I've written. It's the first one I've ever tried to get published. The other three were, um, I think the technical term is not very good. Um, and so I never tried to get them published. I'm working on the next thing, but I, I have an unfortunate uh, habit of not realizing whether these books are any good until I get to the end of them. So we'll see what happens. Well, this one is definitely a good one. I can attest to that. Thank We're coming you. to the end of the program, but we can't let you go without your cultural pick, Ahmad. You grew up in Doha, Qatar, so I can understand why the Workers' Cup, which is a documentary uh, behind the construction for the 2022 World Cup, would catch your eye. Can you tell us a bit more about that? Yeah, absolutely. Um, my obsession with art and literature and, uh, across all genres is with stories that are easier not to tell. Um, and the Workers' Cup is a documentary about about um, what are called third country laborers, uh, people primarily from Pakistan, India, the Philippines, who are brought into countries like Qatar to effectively build the country, um, the infrastructure. In this case, they're building the stadiums that are going to be used in the coming World Cup. Um, these are people who have no voice and they have no rights. Um, and it's very easy to ignore them. And so what, a, what really gets to me about this documentary is that it, it gets at the lives of people who have no voice. Um, I think it's a fascinating topic, and I, I think it's something that we should all inform ourselves about because soon we're going to be watching this World Cup and we're going to ignore the people who made it possible and who in some cases paid with their lives for it. Well, we're going to leave you with a snippet of Adam Sobel's documentary. Thank you for joining us. Ahmad Alakad, American War, will be released here in France in August. Remember our website and connect with us via social media. Do stay tuned. There's more news coming up on France 24 right after this. انطلاقا من حصنا على جعل العمال جزء من عالم كرة القدم. تقام على منشآت قامت على سواعدكم أنتم. After starting this tournament, there are now more royalty to the company. In a tournament like this, maybe scouts will be coming around big players. So I have this hope and courage that maybe I can have a way out.